name is Rory O'Toole. And my name is Matt Schultz. And this is How to Be. The podcast where we discuss ancient wisdom, modern hacks, paperback self-help books, and pithy platitudes. In the hopes of figuring out the best way to live this one precious and wild life. Have the French mastered the art of living? Is our American lifestyle lacking a certain je ne sais quoi? Join us as we discuss the French lifestyle trend and what it has to teach us about eating, raising our families, and being chic. Bonjour, Rory. Bonjour, Matt. So housekeeping. The weather conspiracy. Well, a new element has been added to it. Can you remind our our viewers, our listeners? So I mentioned in a previous episode that I thought um, the weather app was lying to me in a coordinated effort from the government and corporations to make the climate emergency seem less severe. So it was actually hotter outside than my weather app was telling me in order to dissuade mass hysteria. Okay. Cause it mm-hmm. felt a lot hotter out and more humid than what the humidity level was telling me. And the heat level was telling me on my app. Now I looked into this a little bit more and discovered that there's something called the dew point which greatly impacts how, what it feels like out, outside. So you, if you have a dew, even though your humidity could be at a perfect 50%, if your dew points at 59, that's muggy, baby. That's muggy. But the conspiracy continues. Dew point, if you assign a numerical value to every letter in dew point, you get, and add up all the numbers, you get 166, <laughs> the same as George Soros. <laughs> Who's George Sor- Soros? He's a Jewish Hungarian billionaire who has a lot of conspiracy theories about him. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. He, he invented right the dew point to confuse you. Yeah, to keep I was you docile and confused. Yeah, that's probably what happened. Was like dew point didn't exist until recently, but I had false memories implanted in me, being like, oh, I guess I've heard them talk about dew point on the news once or twice. Yeah, since my that- childhood. There's no dew point. There's no dew point. Anyway. The right thing. (laughs) Dew point, if anyone's interested, has something to do with the level at which air turns into water. And that's all I can say on that. So I'll keep investigating, but I wanted to provide that update. Okay, Roar. I'm going to tell you something that I saw today when I logged into HBO. You're going to have the same first thought that I had. I'm... I'm sure of it. Okay. There's a big ad for a new Issa Rae show called Rap Shit. Here's the description. Two estranged high school friends from outside Miami reunite to form an all-female rap group hoping to make it in the music industry. Yeah, like that's just the rap storyline they thought they planted in the beginning of Insecure and never followed up on. Exactly. Exactly. Like, I like it first first few episodes, first season of Insecure. You're like, oh, this is going to be a show about her, like hitting the clubs, getting her, you know, rap career off and running. And then all she really does is organize a block party in eight seasons, not eight seasons, five seasons. And even that only comes in sort of at the end. It's not like and I think, you know, that the dropped rap plot line from Insecure made it really hard for me to enjoy insecure it it lingered with me like an like an unclosed parentheses you Wait, know me like too you know i kept being like is this coming back like isn't this supposed to be what they got the audience to think that this was like her so- going to be her source of happiness and yet they never even bring it back up like remember when you were going to do rap yeah it didn't work out for me i didn't really you know i found you know they never even closed it yeah and like we saw her rapping in the mirror it was like sort of like Seinfeld, where we see how like his life processes into his comedy, it really felt like it was not just a plot point. It was really built into the structure of what the show was going to be. And then they Mm -hmm. just dropped it. And then I guess she woke up in the middle of the night a couple months ago and was like, oh, shit, I was going (laughs) to make a show about a rapper called HBO. (laughs) (laughs) 
yeah. pitch this new one. And, you know, let's hope she doesn't forget again. And <laughs> let's hope these two girls aren't like, uh, you know, building a ranch in Montana. And the question is, will will we watch it? Maybe. I stopped watching Insecure. I didn't watch last season. Yeah, it did. It 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 didn't hold through. It did, For, its greatness peaked in season one. Yeah, I totally agree. And also, like it was, it became super. It nothing happened. There was no plot. It was just care. It was just relationships, and you need a little plot. Gotta have a little plot. Nothing would happen for like a whole season. Yeah, you know, it kind of felt like it lost its way in a in a similar way to the way Girls lost its way. Yeah, I know. They're, they're, those shows are compared a lot, obviously. I also yeah. never finished Girls. I only made it through two seasons. It has good moments throughout, but as a as a work, as an entire like thing, you know, it's very incoherent. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it does this thing all the time. Lena Dunham does this thing all the time where she she introduces things that she hasn't set up. And it mm. really bothers me, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like all like of a sudden, you're going to be, a, if you're a character, if you're the main character of your your girls type show, all of a sudden you're a Harlem Globetrotter, but we didn't know you even played basketball. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, I do have this idea for a TV show. Where, okay, so think of like Sabrina the Teenage Witch, you know? I'm familiar. On her 16th birthday, she learns that she's a witch, okay? Obviously, the show starts on her 16th birthday. I say start the show on her 15th birthday. Have one whole season where it's just a show about people in high school. And then totally shock us season two where she becomes a witch. (laughs) Radical genre shift. You could do it with all sorts of things. You could have a rom-com become a horror movie. You could have a horror movie become, you know, like a a psycho killer who all of a sudden gets abducted by aliens. Genre shift midway. Um, Has no one ever done that? Not that I know of. Hmm, Interesting. (sighs) All right. Should we get on to it? Yes, we should. We should get into it. Get onto it. Get into it. We are today. We are talking about being French. Wee wee. Ooh la la. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be doing that a lot. Um, so the premise of this episode is sort of to talk about. It's not sort of. The premise of this episode is we're going to talk about all of the cultural writings. Um, sort of. This thing in our society about um, French people do it better. French people do it right. So there's a lot of popular books that um, we're referring to. So there's the diet book, French Women Don't Get Fat, which is about eating like a French woman. There is Bringing Up Bebe, which is like raising your child like a French bebe. Um, (laughs) Your French bebe will not get fat. Your French bebe will not get fat. Of course, there's think piece after think piece, and I'm sure book after book, although I don't know what the preeminent book is, on the way French women dress, French style. Um, Matt read a book about the French home. Yep, French homes don't get fat. And I read a book that was just sort of a catch-all, how to be how to be Parisian. So all the ways that a Parisian woman is. So it included diet, bebe. <laughs> how to dress, how to wear your hair. So can you tell me? Oh my God. There are so many things, but I would say that the book boils down. The book sort of starts with talking about like the French attitude and what it really is. And, you know, they have this sort of allure, um, Mm. but they're aloof. They're melancholy. They experience ennui with a certain amount of poise and effortlessness to life. It's all about, not looking like you're trying hard, which of course means you do have to try hard. Mm. Um, what about you? How was your book? What? How did they summarize the French disposition in life? I will tell you. Okay, so it's very much like the idea is that the French have mastered the art of living and we mm-hmm. have not. And their homes express this. Now, there's an element to the French home that's very formal. The dinner will be set in a very formal way. But there's also this other element that breaks all the rules. So you'll set the table nicely, but then the woman, your hostess, will say, oh, no, darling, you must eat the asparagus with your fingers. It 
makes one feel like Rousseau's noble savage, because of course, French people are just constantly talking about Rousseau. Rousseau, Voltaire, all of the greats. Yes. But I would say, so there's that, that degree of it, but you know, I, if I had to sum up like the, the, the French home, like, first of all, structurally, it's a, a home of rooms. It's not an open floor plan. I love that. I'm so sick of an open floor plan. I hate it so much. I don't want to see the kitchen while someone, while I'm cooking. I don't want people to see me cooking. Yes. she. So she's very anti that. And I think, you know, the elite often are. There's a lot of, the the intelligentsia in this country um, is against the open floor plan. We don't is like that right? it. right? Yes, there's tons of articles. About I like how you said we. <laughs> we're the intelligentsia. We um, we are. Listen, we're Sarah Lawrence grads. We're educated. Uh, you know, we coastal. don't wear wear eight rings on our fingers. Yeah, we're we're coastal metropolitan elites. You know, oh. um, to to whatever extent that that may be true for us there are certainly extents to which it's you know i I don't think we have the pocketbooks to back it up but that you know that's a little immaterial so we hate the open floor plan you can find a hundred like uh think piece in the new york times and the atlantic about open floor plans but people the real people in this country the real americans they like open floor plans and they keep buying them and developers Um, why do they oh tell me why is it liked well it's cheaper oh it's cheaper no walls to build less walls and i think a lot of people associate it with um looking very open and clean i think the american house is open and and sort of tidy and clean i noticed on hgtv shows the woman is always like and i can watch the kid kids while i'm cooking i can see the kids yeah very on french Exactly. The Who French cares what your child, dumb kids are doing? Yeah, your French child is either off doing something or if they're too young, they're sitting in the kitchen with you holding your cigarette while you cook. <laughs> yeah, they're in the other room spinning a top, a wooden top. <laughs> you know, that's their toy. A little Pinocchio doll on a wooden top. They're like, mommy, come get your cigarette before the ash falls. <laughs> mommy, mama. Mama. So mama. the 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 french home contrary to this open clean home this is how i would describe it based on her descriptions decrepit bohemian lavishness a Ooh. tarnished gilded mirror a glass dish of ammonite fossils an inlaid credenza knitted to the wall with cobwebs see this reminds me of east coast in yeah east coast intellectual wasp thrift you know, like a professor's home in Vermont, well, but not as gold. Yeah, not as gold, but there's something about it that certainly um, overlaps with uh, the hipster aesthetic. She talks about plants and books and statues. It's very anti-minimalist. Mm-hmm. Um, and oh yeah, so listen, here's a, a little quote. So Um, I sat down and looked around the room, noticing a dish of small ammonite fossils excavated in Germany, a jade Buddha she'd bought on San Francisco's Hate Street, and a lacquered box full of tarot cards. Like, this is any given... Friend of ours bedroom. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um... I love it. I mean, I'm here. I'm I'm here for it. The realness, the French realness. Um... (laughs) Yeah, I wonder when was this book written? It's so hard for me to imagine like a French influencer on YouTube not having a clean white home like all the other influencers of the world. Well, I'm sure that their influencer culture yeah. is clean and clean and white. Is it, you think? I think so. I'm not sure. Well, who knows? Because, you know, like we watched that Mina Lay YouTube video about maximalism. So like there's definitely people online talking about this maximalist aesthetic and yeah. very much like what she's talking about here is kind of like si- some similar threads to what we found in that maximal m- maximalism oh, video yes. like have lots of objects that sort of tell the story of your fascinating life oh yes because the french woman is fascinating and enigmatic and 
yes, and and thin. My book was very female centric, you know, you know, the, the full title of it, let me get it. How to be Parisian wherever you are, love, style, and bad habits. It's a little naughty, okay? And it's written by three Parisian friends. And they, um, you know, just talk all about the French woman, French, French woman way of being in the world. And, you know, after I read this book, I was like, I want to be a French woman. Well, this brings up an important point. In this, I find this so fascinating. France is a country, a woman's country. Mm -hmm. The the entire concept of France is marketed towards women. It's Mm -hmm. like been manufactured as this female fantasy. We see it with Jennifer Aniston and friends like, oh, to live in Paris. We see it with Carrie, the fashion. You know, it's like we... And and even it's even to the extent that like when Alexander Petrovsky talks about France being like the best country in the world, it's all it's almost a little emasculating on a man <laughs> to go gaga for France. Yeah, and also the uh, it's marketed as a city of love, the city of romance. I remember as a child, of course, I always wanted to grow up and be a woman of the world, so I was deeply fascinated with Paris and France. And that's why I took French in high school because I considered it such a, you know, the, the educated woman goes to the Sorbonne and speaks Mm -hmm. uh, immaculate French. Yeah. It's for, it's for chicks, man. Is there, is there a man's country? It's for an intellectual, you know, bookish, but sneakily sexy kind of woman, you know? It's, yeah, it's the elevated woman. Now, it's not Miami. Italy is to a oh. lesser extent a country for women. Italy is a hundred percent, not even lesser to me. Don't you think? Uh, that's where women go when they need to get their life back together. That's true. In it's like, every movie, they never go to France to get their life back together. No, you go to France as a young woman to make your dreams come true. You go to Italy as like a, a woman in early middle age because all your dreams fell apart. Exactly. And there you go. You get on a moped. You see the Trevi Fountain. You buy a house in Tuscany. <laughs> you know, you, you learn the... Buy bigger jeans. <laughs> you buy bigger jeans. You eat the pizza. In France, you know, you get the cool haircut you know sabrina have you ever seen the movie sabrina of course of i mean course. that's the ultimate ugly duck plane goes to france mm. and becomes a swan yes and she she's young she's impressionable she yeah she's not a photographer she gets a short haircut she's not at her italy stage yet now there's the other audrey hepburn movie in italy roman holiday roman holiday a rare young woman Mm -hmm. in in italy movie um maybe not rare actually we also have the lizzie mcguire movie um that's true stealing beauty with Liv tyler i guess you know italy can also be for young women but um well it's france is where a young woman goes to learn how to be sophisticated and chic and italy is a country where a woman goes to let herself come alive 100% it's about yes it's about the id yes Mm -hmm. the food the sensuality the sensuality Mm -hmm. whizzy corner and Italy's a bit wilder like truly it is less domesticated land (laughs) than than France so like it makes sense that a woman's id can sort of um that Italy can be sort of the the fantastical playground of the repressed female id. Yes, um, often repressed. Now I need to return to this question. Is there a man's country? Germany? <laughs> <laughs> what about Spain, like a la Hemingway? Yeah, I could see that. I don't think of Spain as female. Running of the bulls. Yeah, no, one goes, no woman goes to Spain to like let herself... to find herself yeah i can't think of one movie like that but i'm still gonna go japan japan is both it's both non-binary it's non-binary um yeah there's no modern day sparta 
<laughs> that sort of imbue is marketed towards that's a gap. There needs to be some sort of country that exploits this marketing gap, a sort of uh, um, the man show country, you know, a con- juggy is dancing on a, a trampoline. On a trampoline. Yeah. Ireland needs to bring in a giant trampoline and put some fine lassies on there. <laughs> <laughs> put it in a tourist fit. Have Rick Steves come by and film there. Yeah. Have Adam Carolla. <laughs> Doing, doing spots for the tourism board. <laughs> Ireland, a place where a man can be a man. Um, yeah, Ireland's like almost there. I feel like they have like, I, Ireland can be pretty, it's kind of masculine. You got the pints. You got the pints. You got the little hats. You got the violent bar brawls. Yeah. Yeah. Rugby. Guy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> now where's the gay man's country the gay man's country i mean israel gets consistently ranked as one of the best gay uh travel locations so that's a gay country um what's another gay country mm, I, can't, I don't know that's that's a marketing gap someone should really seize on that i mean israel is definitely seizing on it and greece yeah i you know i think greece is um pretty homophobic should i not say that Oh, I have no idea. I'm just like, I associate Mykonos with like partying and partying with gayness. You're right. Like at that Lindsay Lohan club, there's exactly. definitely there's definitely some satisfied gay men, gay men <laughs> who are happy to be right where they are. <laughs> so famously, French women do not have a weight problem. There's the book French Women Don't Get Fat. And Matt and I listened to a podcast that talked about that book. Actually, we didn't read the book, um, but they did a good episode uh, on the maintenance phase on that book. And my book that I read also talked about the French diet. You know, uh, French woman is not fat. That France is a very fat phobic country. I get the impression about um, a French woman. Her looks are really important to her in sort of a traditional way. The French woman is tall and lean and effortlessly bony. <laughs> She's got <laughs> cheeks. And so the French diet is sort of a thing that we talk about in America, which is, I think the idea of the French diet, the way we think of it as Americans is French women eat impossibly rich food in small, delicate portions. And with like high quality ingredients. The highest quality ingredients, you know, chocolate straight from the Alps. Mm-hmm. Um vegetables grown by peter rabbit himself <laughs> <laughs> um and i watched several youtube videos on the french diet and there were some interesting key takeaways like i think the book french women don't get fat was a very extreme diet book but actually i watched several youtube videos and the other impression i have is they just do things a little bit differently one of those being yes they eat way smaller portions than americans do they also eat a lot of this vegetable soup apparently um french people love vegetable soup for dinner and going along with bringing up bebe they don't let their their they teach their kids to like like all foods so it's they have a saying there called three three bites to learn to like and they make their kids try three bites Um, but another really big thing is that they take forever to eat. So they have like two hour lunch breaks and they like use all of that time to eat at dinner. They fully set the table every night. They prepare a meal. They all sit down and eat very slowly. It sounds super boring. (laughs) (laughs) But like, what else are we doing? I fill my day without long meals. I know. Talking to you on the phone. And that's wonderful. But like, we're both, you know, doing a lot doing a lot of screen time too so that's your food time right there yeah it's the you know yeah it's interesting that they with they have the amount of screen opportunity same amount of screen opportunities we do presumably and yet it hasn't encroached on their meal time as of yet as of yet now yeah when i listened to this podcast about the french diet it was like i mean i don't know if this is exactly what it is or if this is just how they're portraying it it sounded mm-hmm. so restrictive and like 
you have to be watching yourself constantly. And like, I almost felt like the, the idea of it was supposed to be the exact opposite. Like, don't obsess about food, eat kind of anything under the sun, so long as you eat it mindfully and savor it and like, and, and value its quality. So like, if you go to a patisserie and order like an incredibly sensual little chocolate cake, you know? Ooh, a little moussey cake. A little moussey cake. A little flourless chocolate cake, maybe? Exactly. Like, that's just, you know, that is just not, you're going to take that to your little table, you're going to eat it, and then you're going to be done. Versus like eating a bag of chips in front of the TV. And then, you know, by the time you're done with it, your episode's not over. So you wander back to the fridge and, you know, like sort of, I felt like the idea of it was supposed to be that like the very, the very mindfulness and quality focus of it. Well, I think is that the limit. Well, when I watched all these skinny French women talk about their diet on YouTube, they said that they don't indulge in treats that much but like they do have croissants usually on the weekend for breakfast but not every day you know dessert for them is typically a piece of fruit or yogurt um yeah i mean that's fine i first first of all here's what i'm here's what i'm being drawn to right now about this vegetable soup I don't make enough soup. I'm always <laughs> wanting to make more soups. I never, I never actually do it. Really? I'm so not a soup. It, you would have a long day and what you have to look forward to is a vegetable soup at night. That no. is a little. What about a lunch soup? Lunch soup is, you know, lunch soup is lunch soup. Wait, so the soup is the entree? Yeah, you have a big, you have soup for dinner. You usually, people usually have a lighter dinner. Okay, because they have a big lunch. Sometimes, yeah. Lunch is the main meal? Well, sometimes, yeah. If lunch was the big meal, then they I also could do that. For dinner. They do that in France. They like, if you have a big lunch, you won't have a big dinner. If you know you're going out for dinner, you'll have a lighter lunch. Mm, okay. Also, of course, there's the ideal way of living, according to me, which is small consistent movements they are walking through that beautiful parisian the beautiful parisian cobblestone streets Mm -hmm. to the metro from the metro to their office you know they're taking their bike to the cafe to have a couple glasses of wine with their friends there's just like a lot more integrated purposeful movement in their lives i know you and i especially you like to take walks but that's you're just taking a walk yeah you know like you're not walking to school you know well i will be soon but it's so funny i was just thinking about this at like the sort of a little bit before the pandemic okay so pre-pandemic time covid has not been heard of i was on a walk And I hadn't been doing this. This was not something I did walking without a purpose. Mm. I love walking, but I always would manufacture. I'm going to go buy pasta at, you know, a place three miles away on purpose Mm -hmm. just so I could walk. And I ran into a friend and she was like, where are you going? And I was like, I'm just out for a walk. And I felt embarrassed. I felt embarrassed by it. It felt so strange, such a strange thing to be doing. And I really, now it's like, we're all walking. Walking is, you know, walking really came back. (laughs) You think it came back from the pandemic? Oh yeah. I really. Oh, I actually like that. I used to take walks before the pandemic and I always felt a little embarrassed that I wasn't taking runs. This is after I realized how much I hated running. Mm -hmm. Um, And you're right now I'm like, taking a walk so simple so romantic gets you so connected with your environment your neighborhood you know gives you time to think walking is thinking what if i thought if i'm on the phone with you the whole time yeah that's the thing i'm like blitzing my brain with content all the time so walking isn't thinking (laughs) but it could be you know these european life 
lifestyle where they have the tiny fridge and they go to the market every day to get what they're baking for just two days and walk to the post office and little, little walks. And you see these little old ladies and they're climbing the stairs. Oh, I really, that's what I really idealize about a European life. Yeah. And like that all sounds good. And the thing about that is, is like everything you just described there, stairs, market, post office like it's just life it's just life and for some reason we feel deeply out of touch with that in america and i don't know if maybe people feel this way everywhere i really don't know but like we look to other countries and we're like look at them they eat dinner you know these very simple (laughs) things where it's like we like even that we don't do we don't eat dinner we're like i'll just like heat up some impossible chicken nuggets and dip them in some sauce and i'll just put ketchup and impossible chicken nuggets in a blender and <laughs> have it be iv'd into my yeah <laughs> into my blood while i return emails that's the american way Because, okay, so I have a friend, an Israeli friend, who's been spending a lot of time in France lately. Surprise, surprise, he's male, but he finds it very romantic anyways. He's very attractive. Is he gay? Straight man. The way he talks about France is so similar to the way that I talk about Israel. And I was talking to another friend lately who just, she was in the Czech Republic recently. And the way she talks about the Czech Republic is similar to the way that Omer from Israel talks about France. Matt from America talks about Israel, where it's like, oh, they just live there. It's not all about the rat race. You Mm -hmm. can sit with your friends and have dinner at 11 at night. And so Omer and your friend who went to the Czech Republic. So your Mm -hmm. two friends from Israel who went to other places, they also think that Israel is a rat race. They have the same complaints about Israel that we have about America. No, the friend in the Czech Republic is American. Oh, okay. But so your friend from Israel has the same complaints about Israel being like a rat race that we do about America? Yes. Does everyone think their country is an oppressive system? So here's the theory that I'm working with right now. Mm -hmm. This is rel it's a relative matter to a certain degree. Okay. And by by saying it's a relative matter, I mean wherever you're from, when you go to another country, it's going to seem romantic to you because you're self-selecting sort of the best places to be in. And you are on vacation mm-hmm. and you're plugged into this va- you're not seeing the rat race. It's hidden from you. Well, of course, yeah. So it's relative to a degree, but it's also objective to a degree, by which I mean, no one from Israel is moving to LA or New York and being like, they just live there. (laughs) Well, is anyone visiting and saying that? No. (laughs) It's impossible to think. (laughs) It is impossible to think it for even a second. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I moved to L.A. from Chicago, I was like, they just live here because everyone in L.A. is obviously at like such a slower, different pace. And so many people from New York. I mean, that's why they moved to L.A. because they're like, I'm sick of the rat race. I need to improve my quality of life. That's true. But you're still in the of rat course, race. You have but, a nicer cage. Well, I'm just saying that L.A. relative to other major cities in the U.S. is a little bit slower. Is it slower? A hundred percent. Elaborate on that for me. And people drive slow. People are always running late. People wear jeans to work. People don't drive slow. They're trapped in traffic. Because they're they're on their phone and they're driving slow. (laughs) Oh, because they're on their phone. That's not living. That's not slow living. I'm not saying, no, I'm not saying they're doing slow living. I'm saying they're slow. Mm hmm. They have resigned themselves to, no, it's because they've resigned themselves to the traffic. Yeah. I think LA, you know, 
is a city ruled by by the quality of ambition. You know, you go there to make it. Yeah, but everyone who like makes it or who wants to make it is such a not is so many of them are not hard workers. Mm-hmm. It's like so it's not the same hustle culture as New it, York. It's not even a fraction. Not even a fraction. Interesting. No, no. Interesting. Because yeah, it's like, you know, to a well, certain well, degree, one imagines that every city, like whether it's France, whether it's Tel Aviv, like every city by just the es- the essence of what a city is economically and socially is going to be ruled by the aspect of ambition to a certain degree, because that's where people go to find work in these industries that you can sort of make your way in the world in them. Yeah. To a certain degree. So like Tel Aviv has this, you know, booming tech sector. But when I was living there, you know, I was hanging out with a bunch of bums who were like smoking weed and talking about art. So I was like, people just live here. But, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's really, it's, it's it's not actually true. Well, it's true and it's not true. It's true and it's not true. But I mean, I work at a place. I have an office job. I'm around people. I worked at a restaurant with a bunch of people who wanted to be actors. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a hustle culture, but it's not um, my demographic, that demographic. It's people who have to work six jobs just to live in the outer valley and take buses to work, you know? Yeah, I think, I don't know. It's just like we we seem to, this whole industry of, of being French, of of imagining that the French know how to do things better than we do, is clearly rooted in this deep, deep sense we have that we're that we're doing everything wrong here. Yeah, we always think we're doing everything wrong. I mean, the liberals, white liberals, think that. Yeah, and we often, and they said this in the podcast, the maintenance phase. We often turn to Europe and are like. Oh, this quaint way of being so much more connected to the simple rhythms of life. The French woman, you know, her hair is, you know, she goes to sleep with it wet. But, you know. She does? Yes, because she wants the more interesting texture when she wakes up in the morning. Who wants to sleep on a wet pillow? Well, maybe not sopping wet, maybe like a little damp. That's okay. I, I do that. Hmm. I'm basically a French woman, you know, <laughs> she doesn't wear makeup on a date, but she um, will wear lipstick to the boulangerie <laughs> just in case she runs into someone she knows. She won't wear makeup on a date? No, because she wants to show her date that she doesn't care. Oh, OK. So French beauty is all about like being super minimal and effortless, I guess, unlike their homes, you know, like just a perfect jean and a perfect loafer and a perfect white shirt. Mm-hmm. You know, think Jane Birkin, even though she was British, I think. Think other people. <laughs> think other people. No, I'm, I, I don't really know. Anna Karenina. I, I don't really know what I'm talking about here, but I would imagine this would be my guess that the French woman, when she does do her makeup, is not painting an entire new face onto her face. No, absolutely not. Probably not so much with the foundation, but no, more French like women a, a lip and an eye. French women don't wear foundation because they want their natural beauty to show. They maybe will wear a little concealer, or if they do wear foundation, they mix it with... Um, Wine. Found- <laughs> they mix- Cigarette ash. Butter. <laughs> they mix it with <laughs> moisturizer to make it even thinner. Um, and the French women do get plastic surgery, but only after a certain age and very like, so not the LA face, you know, so mm-hmm. not a real housewife style. In fact, here's a quote from the book. When you see someone with Botox in France, they say that instead of a face free of wrinkles, what you really see is a face full of fear. Oh, okay. You know, I like that. Yeah, I, I mean, think it's we hard. need a little um, cosmetic surgery negativity in our culture. <laughs> we have this very like hands off, like whatever you want to do, whatever makes you happy. What if it's makes if it bothers you, 
whatever makes you happy. And it's like, well, if, if it bothers you, can we examine why first? Like all also, these like, poor women who got BBLs and now the Kar- Kardashians have their BBLs out. And what are they supposed to do? I was so fascinated by this. I was I was reading more about it yesterday. Every All these sort of tidbits you told me about the Kardashians in plastic surgery, because I always thought that their thing was that they they were open about their plastic surgery, but apparently not. No. And apparently the, quite the opposite. And yeah, it's like women have died on the operating table for these trendy BBLs. So I think like, you know, it's not just a personal choice because we do end up creating um, beauty inflation. Mm-hmm. You know, if if now no one has a wrinkled face in their 60s, you know, and you have a wrinkled face in your 60s, what, you know, that might mean that now you're considered to be like looking very aged, mm-hmm. whereas a mere decade ago, you would have been looking appropriate for your age. So these things have societal ramifications. They absolutely do. And I will tell you, French women by American standards do not age well by our standards. They have very wrinkled faces. I mean, just look at Bridget Bardot. Wow. Well, <laughs> OK. Or mm-hmm. Anna Karina. Or um, Anna Jane Karenina. Birkin. No, Anna Karina is a, she was a French actress during like the French Nouveau film. Oh, okay. Oh, I loved her. She's so beautiful in college. Well, sure. The booze and the smoking is not good for the skin. And they don't, they don't intervene. And there's something admirable, admirable about that. I have a very, you know, I, I, I think wrinkles, I think we need to be more wrinkle positive. Okay. I think wrinkles can can look quite lovely. I don't think anyone looks bad because of wrinkles. I am like really? I don't know about that. No, I really believe that. I think if you if 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 your eyes twinkle with a love of life and a wrinkled face, then your wrinkles look like a beautiful expression of that joy. And if you are, you know, now I'm just putting pressure on people to have like joy of life, but and flaw and like adorable wrinkles no the wrinkles are just wrinkles they become adorable when you you know well that's the thing you're damned if you do damned if you don't for a woman you know i often consider getting botox because many it's quite normal in la for women my age to have it but i'm like am i going to be a person who puts botulism in their face to look a little younger it's a yeah i mean you know that's those are the questions we have to ask so the 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 French are not merely skinny, stylish gods <laughs> with with beautifully decorated, de- decrepit houses. They are also apparently masters of the art of parenting, though they probably wouldn't call it the art of parenting. That's very American. Yeah, it's just they're much more blasé about these things. But bringing up Bibe is like a book that a lot of people like me when they're pregnant read. And it's about, I don't know, it's like by, about raising, it's sort of the answer. kind of just made it sound like you're pregnant. Well, I'm not, I'm not okay. pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Um, the antidote to the sort of like child-led parenting style, which can be very popular in America, where like the child decides what their sleep schedule is. The child decides when they're hungry, you know, mm-hmm. and, and your life sort of revolves around your child's like nap schedule and needs. And, you know, it's the opposite. It's you aren't neglectful of your child, but they have to live within a frame that they, they say you have to live within the child has to live within a frame and it has to fit into your life. And you as a mother are never fully a mother. Like you keep all of your other identities um, very much. So um, on the same level, there's no parent mother as high highest form of self. That sounds incredibly healthy to me. Yeah. It's really interesting. Like learning a little bit about this and, I think it's very well, I don't know, we're very well summed up with their relationship to breastfeeding, which is in France, it's very much so not emphasized the way it is here. Um, They say if it basically comes, if you want to do it and it comes easy to you, that's fine. But if it's 
taxing to you or putting pressure on the family and bringing stress into your life, just get the formula. Whereas like here in America, there's so much pressure to breastfeed. Absolutely. Okay. I'm having a thought here that I want to express. So that's what this podcast is for. That's what, that's what we're here for. Expressing your thoughts. (laughs) (laughs) The same impulse that drives us to read these French books is also the same impulse that drives this parent led child and child rearing mentality in America. How? Let me explain. So as we were saying before, we have this deep suspicion in America that we're doing everything wrong, that mm-hmm. our society is bad and bad for us. Like mm-hmm. the, the process of, of socialization that we go through as children is bad for us and is making us into violent, evil people. So I think there's a big thing in our par- in our country's parenting culture, which is like, I'm going to, for my kid, skip society. And we're going to, we're going to, you know, like, we're going to be in this sort of state of state of mommy nature, Alicia Silverstone feeding her kid like, a like a baby bird. Return to what some sort of concoction, mostly imagined of what is natural. Yes. This fantasy of, of. It's, you know, it's not unlike Rousseau's noble savage, Mm. I I dare say. Um, Yeah, I'm going to feed my child like a baby bird. They're going to breastfeed until they're 15 or 16 or until until they decide they're ready to stop. We're going to co-sleep together because that's what we would have done in the cave. Mm -hmm. Um, The the child will tell me when he's done with his diapers. Yeah. So I will be changing his diapers in the third grade if that's what the child wants. So it's that same mistrust of our own culture that leads us to then, on the other hand, look look to Europe for clues, Um, you know, either to this fantasy of of pre-civilized man or this fantasy of European man. Um, And it seems like maybe the French don't, I mean, if this is really truly how they rear their children, it seems like they're not as suspicious of their own cultures not at all and i think i think that that i mean i can't obviously i'm making really broad generalizations but in general that's what we're here for yeah for you to make broad generalizations (laughs) in general in france every for the most part people seem to be more on the same page there's not a lot of like dissent um on these big cultural issues like parenting Um, or, you know, social services, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And as a result, I think that because there's not a lot of dissent, I'm sure that that can feel very rigid. Like you would feel pressure to parent in a very particular way and to have sort of, you know, the the child is supposed to meet the adult where the adult is, not really the other way around. Like they don't Mm -hmm. do a lot of baby talk you know the child is supposed to be well behaved in in public and sit at the table while um the parents talk politics for two hours which from the child's perspective sounds so miserable because time is at a standstill when you're a child (laughs) two hours is eternity um so i and you know the fact of the matter is it's like all children i don't necessarily think probably should be reared the same exact way but it sounds like they there's a little bit of space for that with like well it's within the frame within the frame yeah Yeah. that's what they say so there is a little bit of space but i think that that probably is a downside um of adhering to the system i don't think it's like a perfect parenting system now i ran into someone i know recently who has a kid Mm -hmm. um and not by any means someone I know well, their kid was in the stroller, a young kid, two or three, Mm -hmm. um, more on the two end. Okay. (laughs) And we, we chatted for one second and then they spun the stroller around and and I was already like 15 feet away and they introduced me to the kid and they had to have this little interaction with a two-year-old who Mm -hmm. had a pacifier in her mouth. And it was like, 
ha, you know, like, I don't know. It was, it was, I didn't like it, but I was thinking like, is that like a thing that in, that it's now considered rude to just talk to the adults? I think it is. I think it's like, please acknowledge Bebe. Like, well, in France, it's actually the opposite. It's Bebe needs to learn how to say hello to adults. It's bonjour. And if you don't say bonjour to your adult, any adult you see, it's considered incredibly rude. And that Bebe mm-hmm. is not being raised right. But I don't think, so a, a nice, a lovely little greeting like that is is great. But I think I would imagine that when, um, that the adult is not uh, Stooping required down. to make too much small talk with the kid. <laughs> with the bebe. No, I don't think so. It's again, it's about the child meeting the adult, not the adult meeting the child. Yeah, I gotta say, I like how that sounds. I think we're way too kid kid centered in this country. Oh, I mean, I think anyone likes how that sounds like in theory. I don't know what it's like to be a parent. Obviously, neither of us do. Um, but one of the big fears I have about having children is like my life being totally over and like only having one focus and never being able to do anything because we have this child that whose behavior is completely without outside of my control, you know? Yeah. And you know, the thing, like I've worked with kids a fair amount in my life. And the, the truth about children is that this whole taste three tastes to to try it and sit at the table and just be quiet the kids somehow know psychically if you're really serious about that or not and because most americans will buckle and find something else for the for the kid to eat Mm -hmm. and aren't comfortable letting the kid go hungry and what if the kid starts to make a little fuss in the restaurant will instantly pull up you know tend to their needs that's who we are that's, you know, who I was when it came down to the wire as a teacher. That's how, who most parents are. The kids know that. So none of this actually works for us. <laughs> you have to like truly be more focused on your life than your kid's life. You can't fake it. <laughs> and your kid has to just feel that you, they're not the priority. They have to sense it in a thousand little ways throughout the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, when I was also researching it, it was like um they were the pediatrician, this woman was talking about how her pediatrician told her that um for the first three months your baby is crying and it's always in need, but after three months it becomes manipulation. Like not in this like very like well thought out way that like we adults can manipulate, but it's like the idea that like your child is sort of working your emotional response, Mm -hmm. you know, for, for their, for unimmediate needs is something that I don't think a American pediatrician would like ever really dare to say. And we're so gentle with parents about things like sleep training. Like if you can't sleep train your kid, don't push your stress through, you know, don't put yourself through it. Yeah. Whereas uh, bebés in France are expected to sleep through the night at three, four months, like very early. They're expected to be potty trained very early, as soon as possible. Oh, interesting. You know, and I guess like sort of what this comes down to is like, okay, that, that definitely makes for a better life for the parents. And, um, you know, I had a friend, I have a friend recently, I won't name her. She is a friend of ours. She's a parent. And she said this, what I thought was a very lovely thing, which is like the purpose of having kids is to have a good relationship with them. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, you know, I've never really, for some reason, I've never thought about it that way, but that is what it is. Like you're building a family. You want to have this closeness and then you want, you know, you want a good relationship with them and you also want them to be happy and healthy in their private lives. So I think that those would be the two questions we have to ask here is like, do, you know, is the, is the French parenting style creating a close loving family and is it creating psychologically healthy adults? I have no idea. I do know, however, that the American parent style parenting style is not creating psychologically healthy adults i don't know if that's our parenting style or if that's like our 
everything about the world yeah. we live in. Phones, um, phones, phones. But don't you? Okay, so the problem I have in theory, of course, with the French parenting style is sort of the beauty of it too. The allure is child not at center of family life. But do you ever feel like you met, you know, people and it's like their parents were neglectful? <laughs> it's not like they were bad parents, but they just like, you know, they never like picked them up from school. You know, they, you know, didn't like you they just felt very uncentered in the family and I feel Mm -hmm. like that kind of like can really breed resentment and maybe that resentment comes because of the juxtaposition of other them seeing other families that are where this child is at the center and they're like well I'm not versus in France where it's more homogenous Mm -hmm. but I think I would worry about that yeah I think that's I think that is definitely a concern. Now, this doesn't have to be a neglectful parenting style. The no, it doesn't. It'll be well taken care of. But yeah, that sort of being de- not the center, I, you know, I can imagine that feeling a lot of different ways. Also, like, I feel like there were, I don't feel like I was the center of my parents' universe when I was a little kid. Um, I wasn't... It, it wasn't parented in a f- French style, but my parents were pretty hands off. Mm-hmm. And I think that a big part of what can make what what can make that feel good or bad for me, it, it worked is does does Bebe have a life of their own that they're a center of the parents have their lives? Does the kid have their life? Mm. How does a kid baby have a life, though? Well, baby doesn't, but a kid does by having friends that they can get to on their own. Mm-hmm. You know, in this dovetails with some other issues in our world that like our society is not actually set up well for childhood independence, which necessitates the child centering of American yeah, parenthood. Yeah. So like it's not safe or possible to walk to a friend's house in many, many areas of the country. Yeah. Although and, I think that it could be that in the unsafety of this, the world is a little bit more per- perceived, projected than the reality of it. I'm not but talking still, about you might murderers. not want to take the risk. I'm I'm more talking about non-walkable cities. Oh, I see. Um, you know, like if if I grew up where my dad currently lives, for instance. Oh yeah. The roads have no sidewalks. Cars are whipping down them. The, mm-hmm. ca- the houses are pretty far apart. Um, this is in New Hampshire. You know that would have been that would have been hard. I happened to grow up in a neighborhood with a lot of friends within five minutes walking. Yeah, and one imagines that the French city, being you know um, pre-modern, pre-automobile, mm-hmm. is fairly walkable. So I think you know all of these things are more interconnected than these books would have us believe. And they want us to think that we can just take one little aspect of French culture. I mean, yeah, totally, completely. I mean, not, you know, especially in a socialist country like France, like there's so much more society supporting the raising of your child that like your family doesn't have to like do it all. Yeah. Which is another reason why baby baby gets has to be the center because like no one knows what to do with their kid yeah during the day i gotta say this is this whole industry huga danish huga do french women don't get fat french house german gym you know like there's all these different books and it's a cash cow and i want i want to cash in i feel like i should write a book that's like a jewish concept or like Israeli gays for pays no. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah Israeli gays don't Israeli gays don't get fat <laughs> <laughs> no you can't write a book like that anymore no it would have to be something else Israeli um gays don't get monkeypox <laughs> It's really gay. I, I thought about that. I, I'm not sure if it's a PC joke, but we'll leave oh, it in. We'll I let the viewers okay. decide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, or yeah, like the the se- or finding like a little word, the secret Jewish art of something. Matchmaking. You know? Yes. You should write a dating book like that, where and you like conceive of dating apps as like the matchmaker, and like you have to be your own matchmaker. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that's, I think the that's inventory. a great idea. There you go. Um, because people, we're unhappy and we are lost lost in a desert and we don't know where to go. And these books are here to to lead us in the wrong direction <laughs> but, <laughs> to distract us and romanticize a different way of living yes to to make us think that you know and then that there is an answer do, out there yeah and then you you know you go you buy some incense you you order buy a some sack coco of, chanel perfume yes a sack of ammonite fossils on ebay <laughs> <laughs> and a cut glass dish oh um, but I would say I really actually enjoyed reading about the French and I think they have a lot to offer a woman in her thirties, such as myself. In her mid thirties, one might say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for reminding me of my age. It's so nice of you. Um, I'm in my early thirties. Oh, for one more day. No, for, for a couple, four more days. By the time the listeners hear this, I'll I'll be in my late thirties. <laughs> <laughs> we 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 have a little stockpile of essay, of episodes. We, we, we record in advance, yes. Yes. And we both have birthdays coming up. That we'll is both true. be a year older when this episode comes out, actually. My goodness. Happy mm-hmm. birthday to us. Yeah. But yeah, I also enjoyed reading my book. I also because because I believe this, like this, that I, I actually do believe it. I, I'm aware of the ways in which it's a scam and a distraction, but who can deny that like part of why I loved living in Israel so much is because I'm like the fresh vegetables at the mm-hmm. green grocer and the friendliness with which you talk to your neighbors and the woman beating the rug outside the window of her house. Like, I I sort of have that stain. I really do have that capacity to romanticize the other culture and to think that like surely they've figured it out. Was there anything you missed about America? Um no, not really. I missed um I missed the people that I yeah, love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See Oh, I, I, you lived a lo- abroad for a very long time. I lived abroad only my junior year through an abroad program. So totally different. But when I was there, I, there were just like really random things I missed, like how people would pick up their dog poop in America and they don't do that in Italy. Oh, actually. Okay. Now that you're saying that like a thousand things come to mind, <laughs> the, the chaos, the, 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 the chaos, chaos of lines. Yeah, sort of just the chaos, like the way people park their cars mm-hmm. on the sidewalk, like the fact that like the 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 rule of law is a little less total. Mm-hmm. Now, in some moments you appreciate that, and in other moments you're frustrated by it. Right. Um, it feels, you know, things are a little more open there, a little less tight. Um, regulations are meant to be broken. You can smoke inside certain bars you know yeah no hours on a shop are suggestions uh times a train might leave are estimates <laughs> yeah but certainly it can be incredibly frustrating too when you're like why don't why aren't these people following traffic rules a lot of it for me is like road related mm-hmm all right. So, yeah, this was a fun read. I think if anyone, you know, wants to have a little romantic journey on lifestyle, look into the fresh French way of being. I, you know, it's charming. It's very antithetical to us American hogs. And um, <laughs> it's a little fantasy that I encourage that I think we all could um, have have a little fun, a little benefit from. Yeah, and for for all the guys out there, stay tuned for Spanish men don't talk about their feelings. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Matt. All right, Roar. Goodbye, baby.
Um, how do you say goodbye in in French? Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir, baby. <laughs>